Thank you so much and uh, welcome once again to another series by Gospel Sounders. This is uh, the series, uh, The Tabernacles. It's a 12-part series, and uh, this is the first in the presentation. And uh, uh, today, we are looking at um, the Tabernacles feast and uh, their application. And so I'd like to welcome all of us, wherever we are viewing, wherever we are listening, and uh, that uh, the Lord may be with us as we go through this presentation. And so I'd like us to pray before we begin uh, our series. Um, I'd like us to pray wherever we are as we begin. Our Heavenly Father, glory and honor be unto thy name. Lord, as we share in thy word, we pray that uh, your presence may be with us and uh, your angels may minister unto us. Above all, Lord, how we are praying that uh, it may not just be information, but we may be converted by the things that we learn. Our sins may be blotted out and our names may be written in the book of life. May this uh, production, Lord, bring somebody into truth. In the name of thy son, Jesus Christ, I pray these things. Amen. And so, um, brothers and sisters, I'd like us to uh, have a time to learn the word of God. And uh, we understand that uh, we are living in the day of atonement and much is expected of us as a people that um, we may know the will of God. We may be able to walk in uh, his statutes and uh, be able to form a character that is fit uh, for heaven. And so uh, I pray that uh, I pray that uh, in everything that we shall learn, we may grow closer to Christ. The, the sole purpose of learning is that uh, we may be able to be drawn closer to Christ. Now, we are told that um, the sanctuary is a compacted prophecy of the plan of redemption, and everyone must understand for himself or herself uh, the issues that um, entail the sanctuary because therein is the secret of the destiny of every one of us. And so we can remain ignorant of uh, what uh, uh, the sanctuary in it is uh, totality uh, entails. We can't uh, ignore what the sanctuary in its totality really entails. And so as um, we go through this series, let us try to ask the Lord, what is he speaking to us and uh, what is his purpose for our lives? Now, um, in the book of uh, Exodus chapter Exodus chapter 25, after man entered into sin, there was a broken relationship and uh, God wanted to restore this relationship between himself and man. And so it was the sole purpose of God in Genesis 126 that man may be in his image, man may be in his likeness but sin intruded and then everything was spoiled. And when you come to Exodus 25, eight and nine, he says that make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among you. The ultimate um, uh, goal was for God to dwell in us. But when man sinned, but now he says that make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among you. So that um, uh, his image may be illustrated once again in the midst. And so, that uh, uh, by people beholding uh, his uh, presence amongst them, uh, uh, we may or uh, they may be drawn unto him. And so in Exodus 25, Moses is shown the plan of the tabernacle or the sanctuary. This plan was a simplified version of the heaven, heavenly sanctuary or tabernacle designed to reveal uh, that uh, Jesus Christ is a high priest, a mediator in the plan of salvation. And so we read in Exodus 25, 8 and 9, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. 
according to all that I showed thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so ye shall uh, uh, make it. That, that was the instruction for, uh, 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 for, for, for Moses to give to uh, the Jewish that uh, they may be able to make a sanctuary that God may be able to dwell amongst them. Now, God tells the Israelites, God tells Moses per se that um, he may make a sanctuary according to the pattern that he shall be shown to the mount, which means that um, if this sanctuary was made according to another plan which God had not shown unto Moses, then the sanctuary could not be acceptable to be the the model that will be used for the plan of redemption. And so Moses was to make everything according to the pattern that the Lord had shown him on the mount. Um, We understand that that sanctuary, that tabernacle in the wilderness represents our soul temple because we are told in 1 Corinthians 3.16 that uh, you are the temple of God and the Holy Spirit of God dwells in you. And so uh, when the sanctuary was made according to the pattern and then the sacrifices were offered and accepted, the Shekinah glory came and dwelt into that temple. And we understand that uh, we are told in Romans chapter 12 that uh, uh, um, brethren, I beseech you that offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, which is an acceptable service unto the Lord. And so when we have offered ourselves as a, uh, our bodies as a living uh, a temple, uh, a living sacrifice, then um, when the sacrifices are, are accepted, then the Shekinah glory comes and dwells in us. And so if Moses could have made the temple or the tabernacle in a way that the Lord had not instructed him, then the Lord could have not accepted that tabernacle to be his abode of his Shekinah glory. Now, we cannot just treat our bodies as we would like. We have to uh, uh, um, make sure that uh, we are adhering to the way the Lord has told us we should maintain our bodies so that his Shekinah glory may abode in us. And so we are told, even in the first angel, that um, uh, 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 fear God and give him glory for the hour of his judgment is come. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 tells us that uh, in whatever you do, whether you eat or you drink, do it for the glory of God, that you may do it for the glory of God. And th- this is an important lesson because uh, many people will want Christ to accept them on their terms. And if Moses could have approached God on his terms, not according to the terms that he had been shown, then God could have not accepted him. But today we will want to God to accept us on our own terms instead of uh, building this temple, the soul temple, according to the way he would want it to be built. And uh, so in our dress reform, in our health reform, in how we deal with love, justice, and mercy, we have to adhere to the pattern of the sanctuary or the temple that the Lord has given unto us, the way we relate to each other. And so the, the sanctuary itself, the tabernacle itself, the temple itself was a model of the plan of redemption in how God approaches man and how man deals with the, the uh, other person. And so we want to look into this series and see what um, the Lord really will want us to learn. Um, and uh, just to project something uh, for us, uh, we are told that um, we are told the sanctuary service provided an uh, uh, illustration. That is, uh, the sanctuary service provided an illustration of the way the sinner was to repent and atone for his sins, to bring home to the sinner the consequences of his sin. The sinner placed his hands on the head of the animal and confessed his sins to God. He was then required to slay the sacrificial animal by his own hand as an offering for his sin and collect the blood of the animal. This emphasized the sinner to the sinner that his transgression 
of the law of God was no small matter and that death was the inev inevitable result. The animal that was sacrificed, usually a lamb, was symbolic for Jesus Christ. The lamb of God offered as a sacrifice in our place so that we as sinners do not have to die for our sins. This is one of the most prominent reasons uh, I believe that the sacrifice of Cain was refused. Why? Because he approached the Lord on his own terms. And uh, instead of bringing a sin offering, recognizing, recognizing Christ as the Savior, he brought a thanksgiving offering instead and so refused Christ to be represented uh, by the lamb without defect. Interestingly, when we are dealing with the issue of keeping the feast post-cross or not, it also becomes clear that just as Cain refused Christ as the lamb pre-cross, the feast has negated Christ as the lamb post um, the cross. And so um, uh, the, that was the full extent of the participation on the part of the sinner. From that point forward, all the rest of the service was conducted by a priest or as a mediator between the sinner and God. This was symbolic of Jesus, our high priest, our mediator between us and God, uh, the Father. And so when uh, you entered into the sanctuary, there are things that were in the sanctuary. And uh, some of the things that were in the sanctuary were when you entered into the courtyard, we had um, the uh, um, altar of a burnt offering. Then we had the lava of uh, the basin of water. You entered into the holy place and the most prominent things were the table of the shoe bread on the northern part. And then we had the candlestick on the southern side. Uh, and uh, on, the, on, the, on the eastern side, we had uh, what we call the altar of incense. If you enter into the most holy place, then uh, you had uh, what we call the mercy seat. And it was overshadowed with the two cherubims. These things, we shall be looking at them in uh, specifics. And then inside the table of the covenant, we had the law of God, the rod of Aaron that budded. We had um, the pot of manna. And then we had uh, 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 the, 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 the book of the law that, uh, 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 the book of the law that Moses wrote that was beside the ark of the testimony. And uh, so we shall be looking at these things and uh, um, uh, see their specifics. I was just narrating what was found in the sanctuary. Uh, I'll be really showing my slides when I come to the notes. And so um, these things had their specific importance when it came to the life of um, uh, the kamas in the sanctuary so that um, they may be able to uh, interact with them. They may be able to interact with them and um, have an understanding of um, the will of God in their life, have an understanding of the will of God in their life. And so when uh, you entered into the courtyard, when you entered into the courtyard and uh, I want to maybe project something so that uh, we may be together. If you see my uh, slide, uh, just respond, you have seen it so that uh, we may be together. Can we be able to see the slides? Yes. Thank you so much. So after confessing his sins uh, over the animal and slaying it, the sinner let the priest as a mediator take the lamb or uh, whatever animal was offered and place selected portions of it, uh, such as the fat in Leviticus chapter four, verse nine, on the brazen brass, and you understand that uh, the fat represented the sin. All the fats had to be removed from um, the sacrifice as I show that um, it is only uh, a sacrifice that uh, uh, or a person that all sins had been taken away from him that is acceptable before the Lord. We are not going to be saved in sin. We are going to be saved from sin. And so that is the reason why we have been given probation so that we may accept the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And if we accept it, we are told in 1 John 3, 9, that whatsoever is born of God doth not continue to sin 
because the seed of he who has born him remains in him. And so we are not going to be really saved in sin, brothers and sisters, but we are going to be saved from sin. When Christ comes, he's coming to take a church without any wrinkle or any spot thereof. And so the parts were removed from this sacrifice. And as we offer our bodies as living sacrifices, Christ is able to save us unto the uttermost. He is able to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so the fats were consumed uh, by the flames. For those two poor to offer an animal, an offering of blood was permitted. And you can read that in Leviticus chapter 5, verses 11, which was also burned on the altar. Uh, the altar was constructed of acacia wood covered with brass. And uh, this can be uh, illustrated as the perishable and the unperishable, the, the, the wood being the perishable and uh, the brass being the unperishable, the combination of uh, humanity and divinity. The acacia wood symbolize the works of humanity that but for the brass covering will be consumed by uh, the fire. And so uh, our work per se, we are not saved by our works, but uh, our works are uh, a fruit of the spirit, a fruit of uh, what we have received from Christ. And so the brass was a symbol of suffering. So this altar represented the suffering and death of Jesus Christ that covers and protects the repentant sinner from the divine fire of judgment. The altar had at each of its corners a horn representing the power, strength, honor, and victory of God. Before being sacrificed, the animal was secured to the horns of the altar. You can read that in Psalms chapter 118, verse 27. Blood from the sacrificed animal was placed on the horns of the altar by the priest and the rest was poured out at the bottom of the altar, Exodus 29, 12, and Leviticus chapter 4, verse 7. The fire for the brazen altar of burnt offering was a special divinely lit fire that was started by fire coming down out of heaven. You can also read that in Leviticus chapter 9, verse 24. And um, I'll be able to give notes. If you want the notes, you can just request for the notes, and I'll be able to send you the slides. And so don't worry a lot about the notes. Uh, 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 as we travel together after finishing the series and editing everything, I'll be able to give you the notes. This symbolically represents the fire that will ultimately consume all sinners, known as the lake of fire in Revelation, where actually there shall be that cleansing fire, cleansing everything that uh, uh, really is sinful and purifying the earth so that, uh, as we are told in Matthew chapter 5, the meek shall inherit uh, the earth. And so uh, looking at the lava in Exodus chapter 30, verses 18 to 21 and 38 to 8, it was located between the brazen altar of burnt offering and uh, uh, the sanctuary. The lava was a basin filled with water used for ritual cleansing. And so the lava was made from the brass looking glasses, mirrors of the women. Before handling the animal sacrifices brought by the people, the priest would have to cleanse his hands and feet with water from the lava. This was symbolic of the act of baptism. And uh, Christ, when he is meeting Nicodemus, tells him that uh, you must be born again. Be born of water and be born of the spirit. And uh, um, the, the water is uh, a sign or uh, um an outward proclamation to the world that you belong to another person. And then the, the spirit, being born of the spirit, as we shall see in the book of Acts chapter 2 and uh, Acts chapter 19, it is the reception of the gifts of the Holy Spirit so that we may do the service in the sanctuary of the Lord. Ephesians chapter 4 uh, and uh, from verses 11 onwards, we are told that um, um, a measure of grace is given unto us and to profit all so that um, we may be guided to full maturity, not being tossed about with winds of doctrines. 
And so the Lord empowers and gives us his Holy Spirit so that it may guide us in our daily life that we may not veer off the true path, but we may walk in the sure way of Jesus Christ um, without um, uh, sacrificing of the truth, without um, um, uh, uh, veering off uh, the way of uh, the Lord. And so uh, without the Holy Spirit of God, we cannot be able to walk in righteousness. Without the Holy Spirit of God, we cannot walk in righteousness. So we need the baptism of water, and we need the baptism of uh, the Holy Spirit. And so that was the, um, the main purpose of uh, the lava. And so um, for the people who work in the sanctuary, for the people who are the ministers of the gospel, just as the priest washed his uh, toes and washed his hands, we must be clean if our words will be accompanied by divine power and we be channels of the, uh, the truth and the channels of light to the world. If the high priest or the priests entered into the sanctuary without washing themselves, and without realizing what the symbolism was all about, and uh, they ended there on their own terms, then the sacrifices could not be accepted. You can look at the sons of Aaron who ended on their own terms and neglecting to do the needful things, ended into the sanctuary when they were drunk, the fire came from the Lord and consumed them instead of consuming the sacrifices. And so, as the ministers of the sanctuary, we should be careful. We who minister, in fact, we are told that our judgment will be harsh because we err in a lot of things. We come to the church of God. We come to this assembly of God and we are not purified. And so the Lord will not use impure channels to bring about holiness to those people whom they are ministering. Continued on, um, uh, when uh, the Savior came into this world, he was baptized, not because he was a sinner, but he says to fulfill all righteousness. And so the brazen altar was, uh, uh, the, 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 the baptism water was actually to fulfill all righteousness. And uh, in this water, we are told in uh, the book of Romans chapter six that we rise in newness of life. The, the, the going into water is just a show of what is going inside your spirit. And so um, we have to accept to be washed and we have to accept to uh, have the spirit of God. We have to make our vessels pure by the Spirit of God, if we will be used by God to minister. Going into the most, uh, into the holy place, going into the holy place, we find that um, there was a candlestick. In Exodus chapter 25, verses 39, in Exodus chapter 37, and uh, it is verses 17 to 24, inside the sanctuary itself, in what is known as the first apartment or holy place, were three pieces of furniture. To the south side of the room was large golden uh, can, uh, candle bread or menorah that had six branches off of a central candlestick. Of a central candlestick. And um, the menorah used pure olive oil as fuel. It was the job of the priest to daily trim the wicks, which were made of old priestly garments and fill the bowls of oil so that the menorah will constantly be a source of light for the first apartment of the holy place. The menorah represented Jesus Christ, who is the light of the world. And you can read that in the book of um, John chapter 8, verse 12, where Christ says that I'm the light of the world. But uh, Christ being the vine and as the light of the world, we are the branches. You can read that in John chapter 15. He says that ye are the branches and uh, the branches are purged, are, are trimmed by the Father himself so that they may produce more fruit. 
Jesus being the vine and being the true source of light, according to John 8, 12, he gives us that light as branches and we reflect the light of Christ. We cannot have the light of our own. We cannot have uh, our own light, but the light of Jesus Christ. And Matthew chapter 5, verse 14 says that, uh, let your light so shine and that the people may see thy good works and give glory to your Father which is in heaven. And so if we are reflecting the light of Jesus Christ, then the Father in heaven receives glory. The glory has not to go to humanity. The menorah so represented Jesus Christ, who is the light of the world, and the olive oil was symbolic of the Holy Spirit, and the wicks were symbolic of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Now, um, it is interesting to find that Jesus Christ says that he is the light in John 8, 12. When you go back to the book of uh, John chapter 1, uh, and verses three and four, we are told that um, in him was life and the life was the light of men. So when Jesus Christ says that I'm the light of the world, what he simply means is that he is that life. So whoever receives this light is receiving life. Whoever receives the light, he is receiving life. And uh, where there is light, there is no darkness. And we understand that the life of Jesus Christ is the Holy Spirit. And so where is the, there is the Holy Spirit, there is no darkness or sin per se. And so we cannot say that we have received the light of Jesus Christ and then continue to uh, walk in darkness. In the book of Revelation, we find that Jesus Christ is walking among us the candlestick. He is the light of the seven churches in the book of Revelation. And he writes to the angels of these churches that they may draw light from him and they may be able to give to the churches that uh, they are in charge of. And so the ministers of God should be drawing always light from Christ and giving it to the churches. Uh, Isaiah laments that um, the watchmen have become dumb dogs <clears throat> and uh, they don't give bread in due season. They don't give light to the people. And so he laments about that. And uh, we should be careful that uh, we should not become uh, uh, dumb dogs or we should not, uh, the light of Jesus Christ should not become darkness in us. When uh, the, the candlestick itself was on the southern part, but on the northern part, we had, um, we had um, what we call the table of the shoe bread. We had the table of the shoe bread. In Exodus chapter 25, verses 23 to 30, and uh, Exodus chapter 37, 10 to 16, on the, north side, on the north side of the holy place was a small table known as the table of shoe bread or the bread of his presence. It was constructed of acacia wood and covered with gold. On it were kept 12 loaves of unleavened bread. You can check Leviticus 24, 5 to 9. These loaves were symbolic of Jesus, who is the bread of life. He says in John 6, 35, I'm the bread of life. Um, but they are also represent, represent the 12 tribes of Israel. Also kept in the table of the shoe bread were offerings of wines, Numbers 28, verse 9. So both the bread and the wine of the Lord's Supper were represented here. The table of shoe bread is alluded in... Uh, uh, is alluded in... Uh, is alluded to in Revelation as the throne before the candlestick in chapter 4, verses 2 to 5. This is the place that Satan has tried, tried to usurp, sorry, to the great extent by introducing other doctrines. The devil is trying to overturn the table of the shoebread. And let us talk about this for a minute. This table was on the northern side. This table of shoebread was on the northern side. Very interesting that um, we find, uh, and uh, I'll give you something interesting in the book of Psalms. Allow me. In the book of Psalms, <clears throat> chapter, the division that is uh, uh, Psalm 48, verse 2. 
Uh, Psalms 48 verse 2, if you have your Bibles, it says, beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. And so you find that um, the throne of God was on the northern part of uh, the sanctuary, on the northern side, on the table of the showbread. There we had the throne of God. And in Isaiah chapter 14, Isaiah chapter 14, there is something interesting that uh, uh, verse 13, for thou hast said in thine heart, I'll ascend into heaven, I'll exalt my throne above the stars of God, I'll sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. And so the ultimate point that Satan wanted to be situated was on the northern side. And we are told beautiful is Mount Zion on the side of the north where the Lord is situated. So Satan wanted not only to usurp the place of Christ, but the place of God himself. And himself, insinuating himself on the northern side, he will rule the government both in heaven and on earth by his precepts. Now, he has tried this by uh, introducing, we are told that Christ is the word of God and uh, the word is the truth. And so Satan is trying to sit after being defeated to sit on the sides of the north in the heavenly sanctuary. He came here on earth. And how does he try to sit on the sides of the north on this earth? By introducing other things on the table of showbread, that which is not truth. And that is how he is allowed to sit on the northern side when he is on this earth. We should be careful that everything that um, we preach can be substantiated with the word of God because error does not sanctify. It is only truth that sanctifies. And the whole plot of Satan, he is determined that we may be in error so that we may not be sanctified. For Christ says that sanctify them with the truth, thy word is the truth. And so if we receive the word of Satan, then we miss sanctification. And that is why Satan is trying so much. He, he, he will love to make sure that people do not know the truth. And uh, most of the time we find that the truth is hidden to the people and they're not given the truth. It is the will of Satan that the church of God may not be sanctified. If we are not sanctified, then Christ will not have a pure church to come and take it to his father. And... Uh, in the previous series, I did uh, the, the, the Jewish wedding model where actually the plan of redemption, the, the marriage was to reveal the plan of redemption. Now, no man who is a Christian will go and take a woman unto himself to present before his parents a woman who doesn't fear the Lord. I'm talking about the Christian sphere. And the people who understand the truth and understand we are in the day of atonement. You will not just go pick anyone and bring to your parents that this is going to be my wife. You understand very well that um, uh, you will be failing uh, to reveal uh, the plan of redemption uh, as, it, um, as the marriage has to reveal it. And so Christ also cannot come and take unsanctified church to his father. And the only way is that we can be sanctified is sanctify them by the truth, your word is truth. And this word was found on the table of shoe bread on the northern side, which Satan tried to overthrow in heaven by saying that, oh, angels are pure. They do not need the word of God. They can live without the commandments of God. And so uh, you find that he is trying that, the people may profess Christianity. The people may profess to be sons and daughters of God, but they do not have a, 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 a truth with them. They don't have, like the, the word of God. And so they remain in a state of unsanctified state. And such a church, Christ cannot come to take it home. Uh, if we love to be sanctified, then let us simply love the truth. And so on the west side, uh, sorry, on the west side of uh, the holy place, we had uh, the altar, uh, the golden altar of uh, incense. On the west side of the holy place, immediately before the veil, 
separating the holy place from the most holy place was a small golden uh, altar of incense. It was a brass pot containing hot coals from the brazen altar of burnt offerings. And it was here that a very special blend of incense was burned by the priest, which filled the sanctuary with a sweet smelling cloud and obscured the glory of God over the mercy seat of the ark on the day of atonement, preserving the life of the high priest, Leviticus 16, 13. Sacrificial blood was sometimes put on the horns of the golden altar of incense, Leviticus 4, 7 and 4, um, 18. The golden altar of incense also figures prominently in the book of Revelation. You can check that in uh, Revelation 8, 3 to 5 and uh, Revelation chapter 5 from verse 10 onward with regard to the end of judgment or close of probation on humanity. Now, um, we understand that um, the altar of incense represented um, in Revelation chapter 5. Uh, if you have your Bibles, you can be following. Some verses are not project. In Revelation chapter 5 and uh, verses, um, verses, um, verses 8, Revelation chapter 5, verses 8, it says, And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. In Revelation chapter 8, verses 3, we read, and another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense that it should, he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. Now, if you go to Psalms 40, is that Psalms 42? Uh, the book of Psalms. Our, the division of Psalms 42. Uh, this is what we read. Psalms. Is it, um, sorry, Psalms 41. We are told that uh, the incense uh, represents um, the prayers. The incense uh, represents um, the prayers. And uh, yeah, let, let me give you the verse. Book of Psalms. One forty one, verse one. Sorry, the book of Psalms one forty one, verses two. It says, Let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense, and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Now, this is what I wanted to say that. Um, when you look at Revelation chapter, chapter 5, we are told that the angels had this incense, the orders of incense. And so uh, the angels ministers to the saints and they bring the glad tidings from heaven and they carry our prayers uh, unto heaven. Just at the altar of incense, we had the veil and the veil it had an embroidery of angels, which uh, we are told that uh, they look uh, with great intent into the plan of salvation. And uh, each one of us has a guardian angel that um, uh, will keep us uh, informed of uh, the things which are happening in, uh, uh, in heaven. And so uh, our prayers are like sweet incense. But um, one thing you have to realize is that um, uh, our prayers, if we are seen as they are like, uh, if we are cherishing uh, willfully sin, they are like noise unto the Lord. And our prayers are mingled with the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and offered before the Father. We are told we don't know how to pray. We do not know how to pray, but um, the Spirit intercedes for us with groanings that um, are understandable uh, to the Lord himself. You can check that in the book of Romans chapter 8. Uh, um, it is the spirit that uh, really groans for us. 
as human beings, we are frail and uh, we always will pray and it is for the satisfaction of the things we need in life. But um, the Lord is always striking the cord on our lips so that we may not pray amiss but we may pray that which is the will of the Father which is in heaven. And so we see that um, in the first apartment, we have uh, the altar of burnt offering and we have the basin uh, uh, lava of water, which is uh, a regeneration, a renewal that um, we are entering into a covenant uh, with Jesus Christ. And when we enter into the covenant with Jesus Christ by the blood he shed on Calvary, then he leads us through the sanctuary service uh, by his spirit, by his word, by even uh, teaching us how to pray. And remember, the, the disciples asked Jesus Christ, teach us how to pray. And so also we, we should be asking Jesus Christ, teach us how to pray. And uh, from there, you ended um, inside the veil of the sanctuary. And uh, there you found that. Um, we had um, what we call the Ark of the Testimony, the Ark of the Testimony. And um, let us look at this Ark of the Testimony then, the Ark of the Testimony. This was a box constructed of acacia wood covered with gold. Inside it was kept the two tables of stone upon which the law of God, the Ten Commandments was written. Later it also contained Aaron's rod that budded and a pot of manna. The lid of the ark was called the mercy seat, Exodus 25, verse 17. And above it was where the glory of the Lord was present between the two covering cherubims or angels in either uh, end of the ark. Now, if you observe very carefully the angels, they were not above the, the, the father, but um, they, they just uh, 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 overshadowed Jesus Christ. And uh, the angels cannot be above the father. And so the glory of the Father was radiant above the angels, but uh, these angels, they covered uh, the, the Jesus Christ as the Son of God when in his humanity, uh, he was uh, made a little lower than the angels. And that is why actually they overshadowed him uh, at the mercy seat. And so there above it was where the glory of the Lord was present between the two covering cherubims or angels on either end of the earth. The mercy seat or lead represented Jesus Christ, the mediator for humanity between the law of God that requires the death of the sinner and the merciful God. The high priest was the only person allowed to enter the most holy place where the ark was kept. And that was only one day of the year, the day of atonement known today as Yom Kippur. The ark of the testimony from Solomon's temple was secreted away before the Babylonian cap capture of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar and was never present um, in uh, Herod's temple. The armies of Titus found the Holy of Holies quite empty in 70 AD. The ark remains unlocated today, although there are numerous speculations about its whereabouts. In Revelation, which was written about 95 AD, the ark is seen in chapter 11, verse 19. It is interesting to note that John is seeing the ark of God in the heavenly sanctuary, not the earthly sanctuary. But uh, I shall be covering in detail the issue about the ark of the covenant. So don't miss that presentation where actually we are told the three instances where this ark will be shown just prior to the end of the plan of redemption. And so I won't deal with the ark of the testimony and its way about so much, but um, we shall be dealing in detail with it, where it is and uh, how it shall be used. The ark of the testimony, the activities on the day of, pre of atonement symbolized the people of God, seeking representation by their High priest Jesus Christ in the judgment, who met all the demands of the law perfectly and then was sacrificed for our sins. When you look at what contained was contained in the Ark of Covenant, you look at the Ten Commandments, you look at the health reform by the pot of manna, and uh, looking at the rod of Aaron that budded, that is the priesthood, and uh, the law, the book of the law of Moses, which was beside the Ark of the Testament, which is uh, symbolized as the, the extra writings of the prophets. And we know that uh, we have uh, our pioneers and, uh, uh, and uh, the spirit of prophecy, which um, are uh, the extra writings of the prophet. And I'll specifically say the spirit of prophecy. Uh, 
no man can keep the law and it um, suffices him to enter in heaven. The only righteousness that can be accepted in heaven, which has to be produced in the Ark of the Covenant, is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And uh, the human being can only share in that righteousness by accepting Jesus Christ that we may not be found with the righteousness which is of the law, but the righteousness which is of God by faith in Jesus Christ. And uh, I'll give you a verse for that in uh, Philippians, the book of Philippians chapter three. Philippians chapter three, I'll, I'll be giving you a verse that uh, we may meditate upon Philippians chapter three, verses nine. And be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. So you find that even the righteousness of Jesus Christ is the righteousness of the Father. Christ cannot represent his own righteousness before the Father. He has to present the righteousness of the Father. That is why we are told in John 3:34. Him whom the Father has sent, he gives the Spirit without measure. And why does he give the Spirit without measure? So that it may reproduce the righteousness which is satisfactory to the Father. We are told by Jesus Christ himself that um, the works that I do, it is the Father which is in me that does them. Now, he says that I in the Father and you in me, that we may be one. So the only way to have the righteousness of Jesus, of the Father, is to accept Jesus Christ in our lives. If we accept his abiding presence in our life, then we reproduce the righteousness of the Father because it is the divine spirit of the Father combined with um, the victory of Jesus Christ that gives us that spirit, the efficacious spirit which is able to reproduce the righteousness which is acceptable before the Father. But um, if we could gather all the righteousness that we can think of and present it in heaven as meriting for our salvation, the angels will call it treason. So we can only say, as um, we are told in the, Luke, in the book of Luke chapter 15, Luke chapter 15, and... Uh, Allow me to give you this verse. Uh, is it Luke chapter 15? Or, uh, Luke, chapter, Luke chapter 17, sorry. Luke chapter 17, verses um, 10. Luke chapter 17, verse 10, we are told, So likewise ye, when you shall have done all those things which are commanded you, say we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. You cannot present, you cannot come before the Father and say, okay, I have done everything that you told me to do. And so I need to be in heaven. No, we are told after doing all that we have to do, let us say that we are unprofitable servants. And so, uh, the only way that we can enter into the most holy place is uh, to accept Jesus Christ. After accepting Jesus Christ, then we can even approach the Father because the Father lives in an approachable, um, in an approachable light. And it is by beholding Jesus Christ that we are turned from glory to glory and then we can appear before the Father. Without that, we cannot appear before the Father. We can only appear before the Father in the light of Jesus Christ. Now, I, I just want to go quickly into the second uh, segment of um, this uh, presentation. I know time is gone. But um, after going through the apartments of uh, the sanctuary, and because we are dealing with the tabernacles, you must understand that uh, we had what we call the festal calendar in the sanctuary also, which had uh, seven feasts, seven feasts. But uh, 
in the introduction of the seven feast in Leviticus chapter 23, we find that uh, it was preceded by the Sabbath, which is um, the seventh day in uh, Leviticus chapter 23, verse 3. And uh, the Sabbath was given as uh, a sign of uh, recreation. Man was given the Sabbath before sin, and it was to enjoy the rest with his maker. But um, after sin, the Sabbath was given as a sign of recreation. Now, before sin, we are told that um, the Lord sanctified the Sabbath and set it apart holy. It was the climaxing event uh, uh, in the whole creation to give man Sabbath. And uh, it was to show him his finished works of creation. So after sin, we are given the Sabbath as a sign of recreation of Christ finishing his work in us. I gave them my Sabbath that they may know that I'm the Lord who sanctifies them. And so as it was a crowning act of his creative power, so the Sabbath is given unto us as a sign of restoration and recreation. If we approach the Sabbath without understanding that we are being recreated and made whole so that we may be able to share in the finished works of God, then uh, we can just be coming into the Sabbath as uh, a routine, as um, something which is normal, but uh, uh, without uh, it will not profit us in anything. It is in the center of the Decalogue to show that um, it is the full crumb of the Ten Commandments. Actually, uh, no one keeping the Sabbath can sin against God and can sin against his neighbor. Why? Because in the Sabbath, in the eyes of God, we are one. There is no rich, there is no poor, there is no high, there is no low. We are one. And so the keeping of the Sabbath shows that we recognize that um, God is sovereign. That is the first four commandments. And then all other human beings are like us. We are equal before the Lord, and uh, there is no partiality before God. And so it is a sign that we accept that we are all one in Christ, and there is no one who is greater than the other. If we come to the church of God and we are jostling and scrambling for positions, we don't love each other, and uh, uh, we are trying to be kings and queens in the church of God, then we don't understand what is the Sabbath. When such a thing starts happening, you, you know that we have lost the Sabbath. We are just appearing there as a custom and as a day. Again, in the sanctuary, we had um, uh, the feast of um, the Passover, which we understand that um, it was celebrated on the 14th day of the first month. Now, when we shall be looking at these things, we shall find that um, everything in the antitype happened to the day and to the hour. And so I, I want to stop here, and then we shall be going into the feasts of the sanctuary and uh, seeing their meaning unto us and seeing how important they are unto us as a people of God. But um, what will I say as we come to an uh, end of the introductory part of the tabernacles as we shall be going into this series? The sanctuary service, as it was given, it was a compacted prophecy. And each one of us have to understand it for our own selves so that we may not rely on the, uh, uh, on the teaching of anyone or on the information of anyone so that we may not be lost because this is where lies our salvation and our redemption. If we don't understand it for ourselves, then we are bound to be lost. The reason this church was born by the sanctuary message, but of late it has not been sounding and it has been the device of Satan that people may forget the sanctuary so that they may not understand justification, sanctification, and glorification, which are the main points in the plan of redemption. In Daniel chapter, chapter 8, you find that uh, the man of sin trembles upon the sanctuary so that we may look to man 
instead of looking unto Christ. When men start looking to fellow men, they lose focus of Jesus Christ. When you lose the focus of Jesus Christ, then you cannot be part of the people which are, are said in Revelation chapter 14, they follow the Lamb whatsoever he goeth. We shall be following men and never following the Lamb. And so I invite us to study the word of God and study the sanctuary for ourselves and even share ideas so that we may understand this church was born on the platform of the sanctuary. And the only thing that will keep Seventh-day Adventists alive is the sanctuary message. That which brought us into life is the only thing that can keep us, keep us in life. But uh, you have found that we have run after so many things so that the church is in helter skelter. It is being tossed to and fro with every winds of doctrines. If we come back to the sanctuary, these winds of doctrines will disappear because the only person we will behold is Jesus Christ. And as we continue beholding Jesus Christ, he says that, uh, and they shall know me and they shall know of my doctrine. If we get into intimate with Jesus Christ, then we shall know of his doctrines. But because we have left the sanctuary message and uh, we are looking unto men, we cannot know of the doctrine of Christ. And that yeah. is why we have a lot of uh, disunity, a lot of uh, discontent voices uh, and um, people splitting every now and then because uh, I'll share this last point as we close. When we approach the sanctuary, we receive of Jesus Christ. The spirit of Christ in you and the spirit of Christ in me will bring harmony. Amen. But because we are not having Christ in us, we cannot have the harmony that is needed because everyone is bringing from their own systems. They are not drinking from the fountain of life. But if we come back to the sanctuary, we shall be drinking from the fountain of life. And all these things that are dividing us, they shall disappear. And then we shall be one. And then we shall accomplish the purpose of God and the prayer of Jesus Christ in John chapter 17, that they may be one as me, you, Father, and me, we are one. Otherwise, may the Lord bless us. And uh, I pray that we will learn. And if there is unlearning also, that we may unlearn so that uh, Christ may minister unto us. Shall we close um, with um, a word of uh, prayer? Our Father, which art in heaven, thank you once again that. Uh, you have ordained us not to be lost, but uh, to be saved. And so whatever thing that you can do for us, Lord, we pray that you may do it. And uh, you may give us the strength to yield our hearts, which are stubborn, that uh, you may create in us a new heart, a heart of flesh, and not a heart, you may remove the heart of stone. So that uh, as your word, which is a seed, falls on our hearts, Heavenly Father, it may find a fertile ground which will reproduce the fruit of the spirit. Thank you for your children. And as we go through this series, Lord, speak to us individually and as a church. For I pray these things in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.